The Cambrian period is the first geological time period of the Paleozoic era. This period lasted from 541 million to 485.4 million years ago, or more than 55 million years, and marked a dramatic burst of evolutionary changes in life on Earth, known as the Cambrian Explosion. Among the animals that evolved during this period were the chordates, animals with a dorsal nerve cord, hard-bodied brachiopods, which resembled clams, and arthropods, ancestors of spiders, insects, and crustaceans. In the early Cambrian, Earth was generally cold, but was gradually warming as the glaciers of the late Proterozoic Eon receded. Tectonic evidence suggests that the single supercontinent Rodinia broke apart, and by the early to mid Cambrian, there were two continents Gondwana and Laurentia. Before the Cambrian, life on Earth consisted mainly of single celled organisms, a handful of multicellular organisms, and algae. However, during the Cambrian explosion, many of the animals that emerged had hard body parts, such as shells that could be preserved in rocks. Thus, the fossil record as we know it today became only possible after the appearance of new life forms during the Cambrian period. Odontogryphus is a genus of soft bodied animals known from Middle Cambrian fossil bed. Odontogryphus is a flat, oval bilaterian which apparently had a single muscular foot and a shell on its back that was moderately rigid, but of a material unsuited to fossilization. Odontogryphus has become prominent in the debate that has gone on since 1990 about the evolutionary origins of mollusks, annelid worms, and brachiopods. It is thought that Odontogryphus feeding apparatus, which is nearly identical to Wibaxius, is an early version of the molluscan radula, a chitinous tongue that bears multiple rows of rasping teeth. Hence, Odontogryphus and Wibaxia are often classified as closely related to true mollusks. Odontogryphus was apparently a very rare species, accounting for less than 0.5% of the individual organisms found in the same fossil beds. This entirely soft-bodied animal is ovoid and dorsoventrally compressed, reaching up to 125 mm in length and 43 mm in width. The front and back are semicircular in outline and of similar size. The mouth is ventral with a radula composed of two primary tooth rows. A muscular foot extends from behind the mouth to the posterior part of the animal and is surrounded by gills or stenidia except at the front. The dorsal surface is smooth and does not bear any shells, spines or plates. Internally, a large stomach is preserved with a narrow and straight intestine ending in a subterminal anus. The presence of a radula suggests that Odontogryphus was a grazer, using its teeth to rasp and ingest food. Locomotory waves within the large foot would have enabled the animal to crawl along the surface of the mud. Odontogryphus might have fed on benthic, sheet-like masses of the cyanobacterium moronia, since fossils of both are often found associated in the same layers. A microscopic worm that lived about 505 million years ago was a patchwork species with body parts that matched up to different worm families, confounding experts who tried to classify the tiny creature. If it weren't weird enough already, Scientists recently discovered that it sports a set of hidden jaws that had gone undetected for more than 100 years. Amisquia sagitiformis had an elongated, flat and soft body measuring less than 2 inches 5 cm long. It had a rounded head tipped with two sensory tentacles, flaps extending along its sides and a paddle-like tail. Amisquia, which was described in 1911, somewhat resembled its cousins in the arrow worm group but it lacked some of their distinctive features, such as spines near the head that are used for grasping prey. During the Cambrian period, about 543 million to 490 million years ago, animal life diversified at an astounding rate. As a result, plenty of strange-looking creatures thrived alongside Amisquia, such as an eyeless worm that resembled a kitchen brush, a segmented, many-limbed, worm-like animal called a lobopod and a fierce predatory smiling worm with multiple legs and spines studding its back. However, many of these so-called weird wonders that lived hundreds of millions of years ago weren't that different from their modern-day descendants. 
In fact, many types of the microscopic worms that are around today retain very similar anatomy to ancient and bizarre ancestors like Amisquia. You might have heard of vagina dentata, the mythical toothed vagina born of male paranoia. But have you heard of the carnivorous penis-shaped worm known as Atoya prolifica? These 505 million year old phallus-like creature actually had a throat full of teeth. Paleontologist Charles Walcott first discovered Atoya prolifica in 1911 in the Burgess Shale, a geologic formation in the Canadian Rockies. A toy is a priapalate worm with a tooth-lined mouth part, proboscis that could be inverted into the trunk. A short posterior tail extension could also be inverted. A toy reached 15 cm in length. The smallest specimens, presumably juveniles but identical to adults, were just 1 cm long. The proboscis was adorned with 28 rows of hooks interspersed with a variety of spines. The worms are usually found curved into U-shape with their sediment-filled guts often visible running down the center of the organism. The trunk was annulated and bore two sets of four hooks arranged in a ring towards the rear end. These are the only traces of bilateral symmetry, with a radial symmetry superimposed on the organism. Otoya periodically shed its cuticle to allow growth. It is one of the more abundant Burgess shield organisms, accounting for over 80% of the Walcott query prior palate and over 1.3% of the entire Walcott query community. An ancient creature that looks like an angry minion with no anus is more closely related to penis worms and mud dragons than to humans, a new study suggests. The 500 million year old Saccharitis coronarius was previously tied to a group of animals called deuterostomes that produced vertebrates and humans, suggesting it was our earliest known ancestor. But a new research proves that it is an ecdysozoan, a group that includes insects and marine invertebrates, such as penis worms and mud dragons, and which diverged from a common ancestor to humans much further back in evolutionary history. The latest findings make an important amendment to the evolutionary tree and our understanding of how life developed. The early Cambrian species is only about 0.5 mm long and found in microfossils in the Shangxi province of northwest China. Scientists used a type of particle accelerator called a synchrotron to produce a detailed X-ray images of the fossil that revealed microscopic details about its body plan. The original interpretation of Saccharitis coronarius, first published in 2017, concluded that the holes around its mouth were pores and potentially a precursor for gills. The new research concluded that Saccharitis coronarius actually had spines that came through these holes, which broke off during fossilization. The lack of anus is an important feature, no matter what group Saccharitis is in, as it contributes to the understanding of how body plants evolved. The new research suggests that early ecdysozoans had a greater range of body plan designs than previously thought and there may be more body plans waiting to be discovered. All we really know is that they are tiny, they have a mouth and no anus. Whatever went in their mouth had to come out of their mouth after they finished processing it. It is a strange way to live, but it worked for them. It is a crude simplification of our species, sure, but look far enough back on the animal family tree and you will find an ancestor organism that is little more than a digestive tract with some meat wrapped around it. Limbless and hungry, like a sentient macaroni, this ancient creepy crawler was the first bilaterian, an organism with two symmetrical sides, a distinct front and back end, and a continuous gut connecting them. A team of scientists analyzed a chunk of rock containing an ancient undersea burrow found deep below Australia. They found several fossil organisms preserved near the burrows, each creature about the size and shape of a grain of rice and dating to roughly 555 million years ago. The burrows were clearly made by wriggling creatures with distinct front and back sides, but to get a more detailed picture of those ancient burrowers, the researchers analyzed the fossils with a 3D laser scanner. They found that the tiny animals not only had a clear head and tail, but also had a bilaterally symmetrical body and faintly grooved musculature similar to a worm. 
The burrows also preserve crosswise, V-shaped ridges, suggesting Icaria warriotia, moved by contracting muscles across its body like a worm known as peristaltic locomotion. Icaria warriotia lived during the Ediacaran period 571 million to 539 million years ago, when the first non-microscopic multicellular creatures emerged. At the time, the world was chiefly populated by amorphous undersea blobs. Most Ediacaran animals died in a mass extinction event, leaving no links to modern animals. Icaria warriotia, however, is an exception. Trace fossils of their burrows persist into the Cambrian period, suggesting they survived long enough to evolve bilaterian descendants. One day, half a billion years ago, when Earth was primarily populated by a menagerie of undersea blobs, a spiky little millipede took a stroll along the muddy ocean floor and died. What do we know about this busy undersea commuter? Where was it hustling off to? Did it have dreams of being an actor? Scientists can't say for sure. However, thanks to a remarkable fossil that immortalizes both the worm and its final journey in a slab of rock in southern China, this ancient critter has achieved a posthumous claim to fame that any millipede's mother would be proud of. The worm's 550 million year old fossil may represent the earliest known evidence of an animal walking on Earth's surface, incidentally proving that animals have been mobile since at least the Ediacaran period 635 million to 539 million years ago. Like a millipede plated in sharp scales, the creature had a long, thin body spanning up to 4 inches 10 cm long and about 1 inch 3 cm wide made up of about 50 symmetrical segments. Yelingia dwelled on the muddy ocean floor, where it dragged its stringly body around, leaving trails up to 23 inches 58 centimeters long. The researchers couldn't place Yelingia spiciformis definitively on the animal family tree, but suspect it is related to arthropods or annelids. Significantly, Yelingia spiciformis shows bilateral symmetry, meaning the left and right side of its body are identical, just like humans and most other animals. This may be a characteristic inherent to all humans that evolved to move across the Earth's surface, which could make the worm's small steps across the ocean a giant leap for animal kind. Canadia is a bristled worm around 2 to 4 cm long and slightly dorsoventrally flattened. A long pair of smooth tentacles protrudes from the front of its head. The variation in shape seen among these tentacles suggests that the organism could contract and extend them. The rest of the body consists of 20 to 22 trunk segments, each bearing a pair of lateral projections called parapodia. Canadia is relatively rare in the Walcott Quarry, representing only 0.05% of the specimens counted in the community. Canadia probably lived close to the seafloor and could have swum by using its bristle fans as paddles and by undulating its body. It would have used its tentacles primarily as sensory organs and its proboscis for feeding on live or dead organisms. Eldonia has a discoidal body with both anus and mouth opening ventrally. Fine rays radiate from a central point within the disc. The gut coils clockwise, viewed from the dorsal surface around the center of the organism and is clearly separated into a pharynx, stomach the darker area, and narrow intestine. There is a pair of relatively stout tentacles around the mouth which probably were used for feeding. Walcott collected hundreds of specimens of Eldonia in a single fossil layer within the phyllopod bed that he called the Great Eldonia Layer. Additional specimens have since been collected from the Walcott Quarry, where they comprise 0.4% of the community. Eldonia has conventionally been interpreted as a free-floating filter feeder. However, based on its morphology, preservational patterns and its similarity with Herpetogaster, a benthic lifestyle has also been proposed, with its tentacles either collecting food from the water or sweeping the seafloor for particles of detritus. It is unclear whether the animal could move at least occasionally or was permanently stationary. Haplophrentis belongs to a group of enigmatic cone-shaped tubular fossils called hyolith that are known only from the Paleozoic. Their taxonomic position is uncertain, 
but the Hyolitha have been regarded as a separate phylum, an extinct class within Mollusca or as stem group mollusks. Like all Hyolith, Haplophrentes had a weakly mineralized skeleton that grew by accretion consisting of a conical living shell conch, capped with a clam-like lid operculum, with two slender, curved and rigid structures known as helens protruding from the shell's opening. The function of these helens is still debated, but one possibility was to allow settlement and stabilization on the seafloor. Haplophrentes carinatus usually grew to around 25 mm in length, although some specimens reached as much as 40 mm. Haplophrentes is relatively common on fossil ridge and in the Walcott Quarry in particular, accounting for 0.35% of the community there. Haplophrentes probably moved very little. Its helens appear unsuited for use in locomotion. Its feeding mode remains somewhat conjectural probably consumed small organic particles from the seafloor. Numerous specimens have been found in aggregates or in the gut of the priapallid worm Atoya prolifica, suggesting Haplophrentis was actively preyed upon and ingested. Naroya consists of two dorsal shields with a convex axial region including a roughly square head shield and an elongated body shield. A pair of long, multi-jointed antenna emerge from beneath the head shield. Behind the antenna are four pairs of cephalic appendages and 14 pairs of trunk appendages. All these appendages are segmented and branch into two with a spiny walking limb made up of seven segments and a filamentous branch consisting of a thin shaft bearing many lamella, flexible and elongated plate-like elements. The basal segment of the biremus appendage is composed of a large spiny plate. Internal structures of Naroya are well preserved with the most conspicuous feature being the complexly branched gut glands visible on the cephalic shield. The gut passes along the whole length of the body with paired gut glands visible in the anterior half. Hundreds of specimens of Naroya are known from the Walcott Quarry, where they make up about 0.74% of the community. Naroya likely spent much of its time walking on the seafloor, since the rigidity of its appendages would only allow for limited periods of swimming. It would have sensed its environment, including food items, using its antenna. Naroya used the segmented walking limbs of its biremus appendages for walking and for manipulating food items, which were crushed and moved towards the mouth using the spiny basal plate. Hodia has a bilaterally symmetrical body that is broadly divisible into two sections of equal length. The anterior region is a complex of non-mineralized carapaces consisting of one dorsal triangular hush element and two lateral subrectangular P elements. Mouth parts are on the ventral surface of the head and consist of a circlet of 32 tapering and overlapping plates four large and 28 small with spines lining the square inner opening. Within the central opening are up to five inner rows of toothed plates. A pair of appendages flanks the mouth part, each with nine thin segments with short dorsal spines and seven elongated ventral spines. Complete specimens are up to 20 cm in length, although disarticulated fragments may suggest a large body size up to 50 cm long. Over 700 specimens of Hodia have been identified, most of which are disarticulated. Hodia is found in all Burgess Shale quarries on Fossil Ridge and is particularly abundant in Raymond Quarry, where it makes up to almost 1% of the community 240 specimens. Hodia was likely nectonic, since there are no trunk limbs for walking and the numerous gills suggest an active swimming lifestyle. The animal propelled itself through the water columned by waving its lateral lobes and gills. The large eyes, prominent appendages and spiny mouth parts suggest that Hodia actively sought out moving prey items. Although the function of the frontal carapace remains unknown, it may have played a role in prey capture. Nectocaris is regarded as an early stem group mollusk close to the cephalopods. The body of Nectocaris is kite shaped and can reach up to 72 mm in length, including two flexible tentacles that extend forwards from the head, which also bears a pair of camera type eyes on short stalks. A long, nozzle like funnel originates under the base of the head. The main body has wide lateral fins with transverse bars. 
A large axial cavity contains paired gills. Nectaris is known from 90 specimens on Fossil Ridge, mostly from the Collins Quarry. It is rare or absent at most other Burgess Shale localities. Only two specimens, including the holotype, have been found in the Walkett Quarry. A free-swimming predator or scavenger, Nectaris would have fed on small prey items with its prehensile tentacles in a similar fashion to squid today. It is primary mode of propulsion would have been in the flexing of its fins. It may have supplemented this by squirting water from its funnel. The funnel was also used to inhale and exhale water, which entered the animal's body cavity to oxygenate the large internal gills. Also, the absence of a shell in Nectaris indicates that cephalopods, which were previously thought to have evolved later in the Cambrian from snail-like Monoplacophorans did not require a buoyant shell to start swimming, but derived their shell independently of other mollusk lineages. The classification of this animal remains ambiguous, but is thought to belong to the Halvaxids, a group including Vivaxia and Halkyrids. Specimens vary from 6 mm to 11.3 mm in length. The ventral side is flat whereas the dorsal surface is rounded in cross-section, bearing three zones of sclerites and one anterior shell. A set of relatively small sclerites is present around the margins of the body. These appear flat and slightly curved in one direction. Above this marginal set is a second set of much longer sclerites that seem to originate from a narrow zone along the entire length of the body. These are circular in cross-section, appear to have a larger base, and tend to be curved and pointing upwards. They are probably hollow and bear one or two ridges. The presence of kinked sclerites suggests a lack of mineralization. A third set of much smaller sclerites covers the convex dorsal side of the body, but these are not clearly preserved. The shell, which was presumably mineralized, is triangular in outline with the pointed end towards the front. Fine striations along the shell are probably growth lines, indicating that growth occurred from the front to the back. Orthrosanclus is similar in overall aspect and probably in ecology to the better known Vivaxia corrugata. Orthrosanclus, like Vivaxia, was probably herbivorous and would have crept along the seafloor in search for food. The Cambrian commenced with the explosion of all life forms and ended with a mass extinction. Glaciers lowered the temperatures of the shallow seas, which housed all of the planet's new species. Alterations in temperatures and oxygen in the waters eliminated species that could not adapt quickly enough.